Today we've got Fahim Hussein coming to speak to us, um, which is really exciting. Um, we are all really looking forward to the talk and he's going to be talking to us about his experiences in working within refugee camps. And yeah, I'm going to pass straight over and let him start. We are aiming for a, about a 20 to 30 minute talk and then we've got space then for about 30 minutes afterwards for a Q&A session. Thank you, Anna. Um, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Um, very happy new year to you. Um, a good morning from where I am right now. Um, and, uh, it's uh, great to be here. Um, I have amazing, um, experience working with Reem and of late with Anna and, i um, looking forward to, uh, share some of my experience, uh, with, uh, with the group. So the way we are going to do it today, um, and I'm hoping that uh, some of you at least read through the um, uh, excerpt or the abstract that we shared, um, I'm going to share my experience on a multi-year research on mobility aid in world's uh, biggest refugee camp uh, based in uh, Bangladesh, in the border of Myanmar and Bangladesh. Uh, and we will be talking about, briefly go through uh, the things we have done um, in these last few years, including COVID years, uh, when we had global shutdowns. Um, and in addition to this, I will be also talking about some other relevant issues, not just that research, but related to the research in terms of the research methods, in terms of mental health, in terms of gender issues, in terms of coordinating be between the so-called global south and global north, um, and uh, so many other things. Uh, so there are uh, lots of things uh, that I will be touching up on or uh, giving hints to. Um, and then afterwards, uh, I'm open to conversations and clarifications and questions. So the way I'm going to do it, I will share the slides. Hopefully, I will be able to do it. Can you see the slides? Yeah, awesome, thanks. Let's do the slideshow. Okay. So, rede redesigning mobility aid for challenging environments, a case study from the world's re largest refugee camp. And we are talking about a city of 1.3 million people. And when we are talking about this, this city has been, we, we call it a city, and it has been established uh, overnight when we are talking about Rohingya population, one of the most persecuted population in the world, uh, and uh, it has been stateless uh, uh, forever, uh, since at least um, um, late 70s, uh, with, the, with the new constitutions coming into Myanmar, when they were not officially recognized as one of the Myanmar national groups, ethnic groups. And from then onwards, they have been in uh, ethnic uh, victim of ethnic cleansing. They have been part of uh, open air prisons in their own land, uh, and so on and so forth. But in 2017, so they have been, um, uh, some of the Rohingyas have been fleeing the country, uh, Myanmar, uh, since late 70s or even earlier. But in 2017, what happened, there had been a very planned way of doing uh, collective ethnic cleansing using uh, different social media platforms and, of course, uh, uh, the militias and the local ethnic uh, majority group uh, had um, uh, coordination uh, of doing that. Um, and the uh, majority of the Rohingyas actually had to flee uh, to escape the persecution the and uh, you know uh, planned uh, rape camps were there and definitely uh, they were targeted uh, for mass killing and right now what we are seeing here is 1.3 million people uh, overall uh, living in the border of Myanmar and Bangladesh and we are looking into different uh, sub camps overall we are uh, looking into 1.3 million population, uh, and they are divided into different subcamps. And what we have seen, um, the, tr the growing trend within um, the refugee population uh, is uh, around 8% uh, 
uh, are living with some sort of a disability. Um, so the whole idea here is that we are going to talk about the mobility aid that we have used um, when we talk about displaced people. Now, I am not a mobility expert. What I am expert, not expert, what I'm dealing with for the last seven, eight years is displaced people. Now, there is a huge issue when we saw that there are discriminations when we are talking in, in terms of accessibility, uh, or physical mobility. And then imagine the statelessness of people, the population when people are not considered um, as uh, you know, full citizens of a country, they do not have legal pres uh, representations. And if th those are the cases, then the mobility uh, related issues actually take a bad match. And then we see a lot of more discriminations. So one of the things we really wanted to see as a group, and we'll be talking about the group there in uh, very shortly, um, that how does it how, how does it look in the biggest refugee camp when these people are coming. And what we have seen around uh, a big part of these uh, people uh, that we are dealing with, the Rohingyas, have physical mobility, have issues um, in uh, walking around the terrains, the rough terrains of the camps. Um, and then if there are issues, then how we are actually uh, dealing with this. So that has been the, that has been um, the, overarching goal of this. And uh, so the re our research was part of this grant from creating hope in conflict. Uh, it was a humanitarian grant challenge. And uh, we had uh, people from all over. Our primary uh, investigator, uh, she has been based in uh, Sunni Korea. Um, and our lead engineer uh, was during that time based in Greece. And I was based in um, the USA. Uh, but our partner in the local camp has been the local NGO I have been working uh, for the last uh, at least uh, 15 years. So we had all over uh, from uh, different countries uh, to look into things. And initially we thought it is not a problem because we could travel, we could go and we, we know the people in person. But then of course uh, COVID happened and we absolutely had no way uh, to move around. Uh, so we had to work remotely, and hence the challenge uh, that multiplied. So the main question in terms of uh, research-wise was, can ICT support the mobility needs of refugees with physical disabilities? Uh, then we were also interested to see what kind of ICT tools uh, we can use for evaluation of access. Um, and then if we want to do the remote assessment, can we use the similar technology uh, um, in the conflict zones and also in, in a um, other stable um, kind of environment? And overall, what are the key challenges if we want to see ICT in these assistive technology ideas for a refugee camp? So interestingly, uh, from the beginning, it has been a bit tech deterministic. We were looking into, okay, there is ICT solutions. Maybe there is, if there are. So then how can we uh, make sure to implement it? So, but we were also definitely very much open to see, yes, it's a tech deterministic uh, hypothesis that we have, uh, but let's be open to ideas to see how innovation has happened, how people are, are being challenged. More interestingly, we were also uh, uh, very much aware of the fact that there is a definitely a supply chain issue, uh, COVID or not, when it comes to mobility aid. The crutch shoes, uh, the rubber in, in every crutches that uh, we have been used, the rubber, uh, this mechanism, this, uh, the, the, the things that they have, the extensions that they have are not customized. And especially uh, for uh, Rohingya refugees, what we have seen, um, there had been a very limited uh, supply of uh, crutches. Um, and then uh, those were the traditional crutches. And to make things worse, there was not enough supply uh, and there was no customization. So if, if anything is lost, uh, they, they were done for. So overall, there was a huge uh, challenge. And then what I have initially mentioned, that uh, we had issues with COVID, 
coordination was coordination between high end and the low end, not low end, high end and the local workshops were definitely a challenge um, in terms of communication, in terms of politics, in terms of understanding, uh, and the value of partnership and the mental health of the researchers. We will talk touch base on that as well. We talked about the goals. So initially, uh, the three sourcing the 3D printer was our challenge. We spent around a year, imagine that, to have a durable 3D printer to be uh, to be purchased and uh, sent uh, uh, there in Bangladesh because the the available uh, in in the in the camp areas with the because the available uh, printers we had uh, within the country were not good enough and. Of course, China was closed, so we had to source it from other places, and that was a nightmare. But more interestingly, what happened is our long-trusted NGO uh, had no prior uh, this kind of technical knowledge uh, uh, to, to run things. They know their people, they know how to mobilize uh, in terms of uh, research studies and baseline, we'll talk about that. But to tweak around with the 3D printer, had been a lot of struggle, but nevertheless, we were able to do it. So the, the first step, of course, was to install 3D printers, but then the whole idea was that, okay, um, what we are going to do is that we are going to see whether we can customize uh, the cross shoes. Uh, in, in, instead of having those generic cross shoes that is used for the in the city, say in Manchester or uh, in Dhaka, uh, we are, and also in Cox's Bazaar, seeing the design of cross shoes, we want to see whether we can design with the feedback of uh, the Rohingya community on those terrains, which are rough, which are, you know, muddy uh, in the monsoon uh, season. It's, uh, it's a really actually horrendous experience to walk in those unpaved areas. So what would be, what would be the best uh, designs for those? Can we customize those? And what we have done, there were several um, type of uh, models that we have been uh, using and testing in uh, Korean labs, um, and then uh, tweaking it first initially with uh, the experience in Korea. If you can see in the picture here, you will see that uh, there are two types of uh, shoes being used uh, uh, by um, our study participants in Korea as well. Um, and then there were several ones, and then what we have seen, we had the winner of at least two different crutch shoe uh, uh, types that we wanted to test in our lab. But it was the first sourcing the printer and then designing that uh, 3D, uh, 3D printed mold uh, so that we can have multiple uh, designs of crutch shoes and then sourcing the silicon rubber which was also not available in the country or in the region uh, per se uh, to have those uh, prototypes that we were supposed to um, give out to our, uh, our study participants. So what happened was from a hardware point of view, those were some of the struggles. But in addition to this, it was also a huge struggle in terms of mobilizing people to have baseline studies um, and it was during the time, and it we had uh, huge delays uh, in terms of uh, looking for people uh, to have the initial data and then conducting uh, conducting the studies. And during the time when the whole camp um, was shut down, and uh, there were health precautions, huge issues related with uh, um, uh, discriminations against the. Uh, uh, refugees uh, by the humanitarian agencies within the camp areas. But uh, what happened was the baseline study helped us to also redesign some of our um, innovations and some of the designs, the tweaks that we, we needed to do. And so the initial challenge of uh, breaking off the supply chain or working around the supply chain to source things to make sure that we have some customized designs out in the field so that we can test it, we overcame it. And I personally uh, visited the camp even during the shutdowns 
uh, uh, kind of sneak through uh, to make sure that the things are being done um, um, in, in the rightful manner. If you see this image here, you see one of our um, volunteers and we, and we try to blur, even though we have all the ethical permissions, we try to blur the face of the, our uh, study participants uh, in the camps. Uh, we are uh, trying to uh, fit our uh, 3D printed uh, um, um, prototypes uh, there uh, in their crutches, uh, the traditional crutches. In addition, what we have done, uh, we collected data uh, when in, in terms of signal to noise ratio to see when uh, people are using different design crutch shoes, um, how does it help? What is the jerking rate? What is the acceleration rate? Signal to noise ratio, how things are, and uh, what actually helps uh, uh, one design over the other. So in addition to the qualitative interview, we also looked for quantitative uh, uh, evidences to look into. What you are seeing here is a safe space, a part of an open space for the uh, uh, people with mobility challenges, hence uh, those uh, 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 types of, you know, uh, uh, tethered uh, supports are there. A similar thing we have we see in our public transports. And uh, we had multiple cameras um, to record uh, our, our mobility of uh, our users. And uh, it was an interesting struggle for us even to um, capture these videos. First of all, there was not enough light um, um, in, inside the, similar thing because there's no electricity uh, in such uh, spaces, shaded spaces, but we had to manage through that. Um, and then we need to, needed to have a retrofitted uh, whiteboard uh, to make sure that uh, we can uh, record them at the same time. But imagine this, this is also one of the, there was a big issue with gender. We'll talk about it briefly. Uh, but here we wanted to have their ankles being uh, displayable so that we can record that but uh, so we could not do it for the women users because of course of the uh, social norms uh, and they were uh, covering uh, their head to toe uh, and so they had to be uh, not in uh, be part of the, uh, this uh, videotaping as well we did not foresee that before but that was the case uh, but eventually uh, what we have seen is uh, uh, in addition to those video recording, we had um, uh, the baseline survey, we talked about it, but we also had interviews, in-person interviews, and that was something fascinating and overwhelming uh, in many cases because the challenges uh, they face uh, with mobility, the discrimination that they face with mobility, uh, and how they came to, to this stage of uh, lack of accessibility uh, and the physical trauma and the challenges they have and the mental trauma they face. Uh, it was uh, um, something humbling to see the resilience and overwhelming to see the suffering that they have. Um, and um, imagine, uh, this is one of the uh, typical uh, terrains that uh, they have to go through. And it was a much better situation because the bamboo related support uh, was there after two years uh, of the camp uh, around 2019. So, and, and that is a huge struggle for them uh, to go. I remember of walking around 30 minutes to actually uh, make an, uh, conduct an interview with one of the female participants because she was not able, she was not able to come uh, to the place where I was uh, do, collecting data. Um, so rainy season, it's, it's a struggle. It's not just that, it's not just the mobility thing, it's also the, exploitation of the already discriminated people. Uh, when they were given food, the food were stolen. When they're in the medical facility, they're always shoved back in the line. So there's a huge issue with the mobility and we were hoping that this kind of customized crutch shoes would be able to help them uh, to better navigate and better mobilize themselves. Uh, that has been the case. So the questions that we were asking about the need of ICT, we definitely saw that was the that was the case. But the other thing that we have seen, the other challenge that came, were the coordination between different worlds, laboratories, and the scientists and the engineers came in is 
when we had this winner uh, design and that was had to be uh, mass produced then the then the uh, engineering struggle of from a abs material to a massive scale uh, rubber material that we need to do and you know, how to design the metal mold instead of the 3d printed mold um, and what are the te te techno, uh, technical specifications that we need to look into. And so the conversations between uh, different, uh, you know, the uh, very uh, formal, uh, strict, uh, standard maintained labs, and then the street smart Jugar um, uh, workshops has been fascinating. Uh, and what we have seen beyond the technological issues, also the humanity uh, was uh, the, the the spirit of humanity was there. People's willingness to help us uh, to make sure that we reach our goal was fascinating. The, uh, the one of the other things that we were never uh, aware of uh, at the beginning of the study, but then of course we definitely acknowledged and corrected ourselves, is the gender. Uh, uh, dimension of uh, accessibility, definitely in the mobility aid, because women were uh, not uh, accepted to be seen using crutches in the public area. So the mobility of women to begin with in a Rohingya community may be partially related for the persecution, partially related with their socio-religious backgrounds was limited. And then the women with a physical disability definitely were challenged and discouraged uh, uh, to be to be seen. And so the conversation eventually we had, because we were not getting enough uh, women to be a part of the study, uh, even though we knew there were challenges. Um, and that actually uh, prompted us to dig further, to uh, have an understanding of what were the challenges and what we can do more. And then eventually the impact part of it. Um, that's something that is not related to the slides, but we can share about that if you have, have interest about how these crutches um, changed or impacted lives of uh, the women users. Um, so these are uh, this is the winning design that we had. Um, and uh, these are the final products. So imagine we had initially uh, the silicas um, to look into. So those were these are the these are the initial prototypes. And then the final thing that we had was this. And uh, it, the major uh, uh, element of this was similar uh, latex that we use for tires uh, locally. So the material was locally sourced uh, in each one. It has been very durable. And uh, at the end of our project, uh, we had the 400 sets of cut shoes that uh, we distributed um, among uh, our, our, uh, our uh, participants and also our local partner. So there had been a repository. The 3D printer is there. The mechanism is still there. Um, if, uh, if the funding went on, they could have produced more. But of course, it was a pilot. But interestingly, what it showed is definitely uh, the bypassing is possible um, in terms of a supply chain of a very strictly controlled and uh, static uh, crutch shoe um, um, supply chain or crutch shoe ecosystem for the mobility aid, which I think uh, that definitely can be customized. So a lot of partners worked with us, um, part of the Grand Challenge Canada, uh, our local partner, IPSA, has been fascinating, uh, overwhelming, and uh, definitely the Rohingya Students Network and uh, definitely the other uh, donor organizations was there. But more importantly, if um, I can go back, is um, uh, this, uh, in beyond the innovation part of it, what was a surprising thing for us was to see how challenging it become to uh, do field studies uh, during shutdowns. Um, and uh, the, our Zoom conversations was not good enough to conduct 3D uh, uh, printing class, uh, classes or tutorials or uh, building trust, uh, trusted relationships. Uh, the coordination, we talked about the workshops and the high-end labs was fascinating. We have been documenting it um, so that um, we can learn much better things from that for our future projects. But more importantly, the thing that was ignored was mental health 
of the researchers who have been part of it, because uh, including myself, when we have been talking to the people uh, about trauma, uh, about how they have uh, uh, ran or fled for three, four, five days with the injuries, with severed arms, legs, um, and uh, uh, to cross the border or to see loved ones uh, being killed in front of them, but still moving on and then coming to a new land and have uh, issues with their mobility uh, and coping with that personally, but then uh, also collectively. Um, and then to process it, to talk about it uh, objectively is, is, is a struggle. So one of the things that I always talk and share whenever I uh, talk about this kind of research uh, or collecting information um, in, in with people who are vulnerable is it's very important when you, we are designing research, collecting data, analyze it, is to have space, building space and designs uh, for um, uh, support for mental health for the researchers as well. So that's pretty much it in terms of, um, and I'm, I'm sorry for rushing through it, uh, but I'm open to um, definitely questions. Um, I, I, I will definitely talk about a, third, a couple of seconds on this uh, in photograph. And then I have other extra slides that if you are interested, I can share about my other work related with the Rohingya refugees. So this is fascinating for me. This is to me the whole displacement uh, scenario, the way I want to look into it is uh, escaping the brutality and the violent past and running towards a better future. So these uh, amazing uh, Rohingya kids, uh, what we captured, and of course, then we uh, actually get to permission from their parents uh, so that you can use it. That to me is very important. Uh, so that these kind of um, activities can create hope for a better future for uh, the overall displacement crisis. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Fahim. That was such a wonderful talk. Our next seminar series is going to be on the 1st of February, and it's going to be in person and virtually um, with Alan Dix and Miriam Sturdy. It's going to be a joint talk. Um, so I will send that information around again as well. Um, but for now, just a big thank you to Fahim for speaking to us today at such an early time as well. Um, we really do appreciate it. Pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great day, guys.